Naaman was the commander of the armies of the neighboring country, Aram. He was sort of the commander-in-chief, and Aram was a, a country that had caused some problems, invasions, you know, war with uh, Israel. And, and so uh, Naaman had a problem. He had leprosy. And in that day, leprosy was a general term used for uh, any, th any sort of skin funk. If you had skin cancer, skin infections, skin uh, mold, whatever it was, uh, if, if your skin was anything other than, than good looking, that it was called leprosy. So he had leprosy. He had a severe case of ugh, in his skin. And uh, one of Naaman's servants from Israel told, her, told him about a prophet. Say, so here, I got the answer for you. You go, you talk to this prophet, and he will uh, take care of you. And so Naaman, at this point, he's a powerful man, one of the most powerful men in the country, and he's probably tried everything there is to try in the country. He's willing to go to a nation that he's invaded and try something new. So he goes, he, he goes to his uh, king and says, uh, I'd like to do this. And the king says, I'll, I'll send you with a letter. And here, here's how much you should take to offer for this healing. 150 pounds of gold and 750 pounds of silver. That's like the income of a nation for a year. That is an amazing amount of money. And 10 sets of really nice clothing, that's good. 900 pounds of precious metal. All right, this is an amazing sum. The king wants his general healed badly. Naaman's reception when he shows up it is oddly uh, echoes the reception when uh, the three magi, or however many magi they were, when they show up and, and King Herod gets kind of scared because a foreign country has sent nobility and it might be an invasion force on the way. It's the same type of thing. Naaman shows up to the king and says, and hands the king of Israel the letter, and the king reads the letter and says, they're picking a fight. Right? They are looking for a reason to whoop me. They're going to say, because I can't heal him, that, that this is the reason you have disrespected my general and now I must invade your, arm, your, your country. So he's thinking, this is all over. Like, we're doomed. And uh, Elisha, the prophet, hears this and says, eh, send him on down. I'll take care of this. And, and Naaman arrives. And again, think about what this must look like. Right? How many mules does it take to carry 900 pounds of gold and silver? How many guards? If you were going to transport that, how many guards would you take with you? Now, this is quite an entourage. He pulls up with his chariots and horses, and a chariot in that day is like a, a tank. The ancient chariot is a modern day tank. And so he rolls up with his chariots, and so the tanks roll into town, and, and they pull up to Elijah's house, and there, there is Naaman at, the, at Naaman at the front of this procession, wearing all of his gold braid and fancy military uniform, and he shows up to the house, and he is ready to present himself to Elisha. And Elisha sends a servant, to, peeks out the door and says, hey, yeah, you are sick. Go wash at that river. Mm, seven times. Seven times will do you. Head on down. And then the servant goes back in, and, and it's like, he, Naaman's there. He's ready for the big show. And he got told, hey, go down the river. Mm, seven times will do you. And, and Naaman is furious. Absolutely furious. He is expected a, wel a welcome worthy of his majesty, right? And if you read his, just the words, just how the scripture uh, tells us the story, it's great. Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me, he would come out and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure the, the leprosy. And instead, he sends me to this river. Aren't the rivers of Damascus better than this muddy river down over the corner, right? He, he's thinking of the, the pure, clean rivers of Damascus, and he's looking down at that muddy, working river where there are women scrubbing their clothes, right? And he's hot. He's angry. He expected a show. He expected someone to come on out. He expected fireworks, and he expected a bolt from the sky, and bam! Clean, right? He expects big doings. And what he gets told is a servant tells him, hey, head on down, get yourself washed up. It'll work out well. Right? His servants go to him and says, okay, really, 
This is easy. If you'd been asked to do something hard, you'd have done it. This is easy. Seriously, just go do it. And so he goes down. And, and it's, again, imagine the scene with all the big chariots and the entourage and all the guards. They go down to the, the river where people are, like, taking a dip after a hard day at work, and there's women scrubbing their clothes on a washboard or something, and this guy strips down, and it's got to have been an odd thing. Like, he's going down, and everyone else is kind of watching, wash, uh, washing him. Hey, well, wash my clothes. What's up with you? And he goes down, he dunks himself in seven times, he comes up, he's clean, and he's like, again, he comes up water, and he's clean, he's expecting, like, the, the, sky, the, the, the sky to open, and the sun to shine down, and some, like, big light from heaven, big old doings, and he comes up, and he's clean, and it's the same old thing, women over there washing their clothes, yeah, oh, good, you're clean, and he heads on back, and he goes to uh, Elisha, Elisha talks to him this time, and he says, let me give you this uh, income of a nation. Let me give you all of this. And Elisha says, eh, it's okay. Seriously. What's 900 pounds of precious metal between friends? Just, just hold on to it. And uh, he, he asks, well, can I do this? Can I take two mule loads of dirt? Which is an interesting request. First, two mule loads. How much is that? That's like 400 pounds of dirt. Like, he is not asking for a little jar. Like, you go to the beach, you bring back a little jar of sand. No, he's looking for 400. How, how big is 400 pounds of dirt? Right? He's not looking for something to remember this by. He's looking for enough land so that he can take a chunk of Israel back with him. Now he, he, something is connected here. Something is clicked. And he wants to, he, he's going to bring back a whole bunch of dirt. And uh, what's he realized here? Like, the magic was not in the water. In fact, there was no magic that day. It wasn't that the water was special. It's that in going down and joining with all the peop God's people and doing what God's people did, he received something. Right? It wasn't the magic of the, it wasn't the water of the River Jordan. It's that he was gathered with God's people, doing what God's people did. That's where they washed their clothes. That's where they took a dip. That's where he found what he needed. A different context, a different story. There's a pastor on the East Coast, uh, Jason McKelly is his name. And if you ever want an interesting read, he uh, wrote a book called A uh, Hundred Foreskins, Wrestling with uh, Random Bits of the Bible. And, uh, it just goes, the dude is sharp. He reads scripture in a way that I wish I could. Like, he is just insightful, an amazing fellow. And uh, I've been reading his blog, listening to him for years now. And in the last couple years, he's about my age, two kids, wife. Uh, he's served, been serving the same church for about a decade now. And um, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he, was at, and he asked, like, what stage cancer? They say stage one, two, three, four. They said, and he was told, it's beyond stage four. This is stage serious. This is, this is bad. And uh, he, he is still alive. Uh, he will be taking cancer treatments for the rest of his life. It is in remission. But um, he wrote a book about this. Uh, keeping the f cancer is funny. Keeping the faith in stage serious cancer. And uh, cancer is funny, the name of the book. And he, as a cancer patient and pastor, like, what do you expect of a pastor who's in the hospital? Like, who's the pastor to the pastor? Like, when a pastor shows up and you see a pastor in a hospital room, I've had this happen to me. Like, what do you do for the pastor? Because it's not like some people expect the pastor to be all, like, pious and holy and just, like, praying all the time and turning into, like, this instant Mother Teresa. Mm, right? No, it doesn't happen. Right, but he, he grapples with all these questions, and one of the questions he, he grapples with is when we think about God, what, what do we think about God first? Do we think about God primarily as powerful? Is that how we think about God? Like if God's primary attribute is power, if that's what we think about with God, then we start asking a certain set of questions. Right? Why doesn't God do something about evil? If God is power, if God is in control, if God is all-powerful, then why doesn't God do something about evil? Uh, we would expect that God would, if God was all about power, that uh, then God would make it so blazingly obvious, powerfully clear, that, everyone, that, that no one could possibly deny that God exists. 
Uh, and we were made in the image of God. If we're made in, in, in as much as we're made in the image of God, if God is primarily known as power, then we lose our minds when we're not in control. If, if we don't have power ourselves. Right? I, I think to see, and he, as he points out, to see God's primary attribute as power is a common misunderstanding and it leads to a lot of people walking away from the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if it's all about power, then I, I know a guy who um, left the church because he just couldn't understand how bad things could happen. Why doesn't God do something about it? But Jason McKelly reminds me and us and, and as he grapples with this in the middle of his own struggles with cancer is that the primary attribute of God, the best way to understand God, the thing that the Bible tells us about the character of God again and again and again is that God is love. Right? First John tells us multiple times, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We have come to know and we have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that we might not perish but obtain eternal life. The greatest commandments are not about having power over your neighbors. The greatest commandments are what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and will, and love your neighbor as yourself. Faith, hope, and love are the, uh, the virtues, but the greatest of these is love, right? God is primarily known as love. And the greatest moment of power in Scripture is this moment on the cross when love sacrifices all for us. Sacrificial love. We have a community that is loved into being. Literally. We are loved into being. We are baptized into a common family, gathered at a common, at a family table. We are loved into being, and we are loved into being as a community that doesn't have the answers to all the questions. Like, why did Jason McKelly get cancer? Don't know. We don't have the answers. We do not have a community that has the power to control everything. We don't have the community that has all the answers. What we do have is a community of people working together that will walk with us through whatever is in front of us. A community in which we love each other so that when my faith is weak, yours sustain me, sustains me. Right? When, you're, when you can see the glory of Easter and I'm in the middle of a Good Friday moment, I can lean on you. And you can tell me what you see coming over the horizon because I can't quite see it at that moment. If every Sunday is a mini Easter, then there are also going to be many Good Fridays that pop up. And we need each other to keep on telling each other about that Easter that's coming. Brene Brown, another third story. Uh, Brene Brown is another person I've read some and watched and she studies shame and guilt and fear and vulnerability and how we understand that, how we process it, how do we make sense of it. And in the middle of uh, vul studying vulnerability, like she, her mom jokes with her, you should uh, let go and let Brene. I mean, she just needs to be in control. You, you know anyone like that? This has to be in control at all times. And so she hates being vulnerable, and so she's a researcher. So she thought she could get her measuring stick and measure things, and she could just take that measuring stick and just beat vulnerability down so she could control her own vulnerability. And she just broke down in the middle of this. Like, she just lost it. She, she calls it a breakdown. Her therapist calls it a spiritual awakening. She calls it a breakdown. So she just like breaks down and she has to, to grapple with this. She doesn't want to be vulnerable to others. She wants to be in control and she's trying to find answers. In the middle of this breakdown, she goes to church and she said, what she tells, uh, what she'll tell you if you ask her what was she looking for at church, she was looking for an epidural. She wanted to be able to walk into church and she wanted an epidural. She wanted all the pain just to go away, right? You walk into church and everything that's broken and hard out there just goes poof. And you're in here and there is no pain and it all is just perfect and good and wonderful and everything that's broken out there can just stay out there for a while, right? That's what she was looking for. She wanted the epidural and that's not what she found. What she found at church was a midwife, someone to sit with her and say it's hurt, it hurts, but you're going to get through it and I'm right here with you. Quite a difference, isn't it? 
Right? She didn't find a way to make it all go poof. She found the community to walk with her through it, to tell her that this hurts, but it will pass. She didn't find that Jesus made, makes it all perfect, but in, that in, in his church there are fellow disciples who will walk the road together, bound together in baptism, vulnerable to each other, and in that vulnerability they are loved and sustained and they can get through. Today we are uh, remembering the baptism of, of the Lord, this moment when Jesus is baptized, and it's the way that he, so the beginning of the family, so to speak, and we are baptized into that family with Jesus. We accept that we are children of God, uh, and we are bound in this together. And these stories keep on resonating, and there seems to be this common theme that runs through them, that what, what you, they want and what they're offered. Like Naaman wanted fireworks and power, and what he's offered is be part of God's people. Go down and get washed up with everyone else. Right? Just be part of the people. You'll find what you need. Jason McKelly has all this uh, theological education and understanding and the ability to, to parse the Greek and explain the Latin and talk at great length, and, and then he, he gets cancer. And what is he, the, he wants understanding, but what does he get? He gets neighbors who love him, and when he throws up into the passenger seat of his neighbor's car on the way to cancer treatment, they clean it up and throw him back in and off they go. Right? He didn't need understanding, he needed neighbors. Right? And Brene Brown, she wanted to be able to control her life, she wanted this epidural so that she could block the pain and make it all go away, and what was she given? She was given friends who will walk with her in church. We are baptized, we're going to remember our baptism coming up here, and there's, there's not going to be any magic to it, right? It's not going to make it all perfect, it's not going to make all the problems go away, but what it is, it is to remember again that in this place and in this church, we find forgiveness and reconciliation and purpose, and we are walking together towards our eternal salvation. This is how God chose to save us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are welcomed into that family in baptism to be part and made whole. Jesus came to, Jesus became human so that human might become part of, of, of God's divine family. And we remember that today. We are bound together as family and then welcome to the family table. It might not be what we want, but it is what we need. Amen. <laughs>